Electrostatics. Describe the fundamental rule at the base of all electrical phenomena. Explain how an object becomes electrically charged. Describe Coulomb's law. Distinguish between a good conductor and a good insulator. Describe two ways electric charges can be transferred. Describe what happens when a charged object is placed near a conducting surface. Describe what happens when an insulator is in the presence of a charged object. Electrostatics involves electric charges, the forces between them, and their behavior in materials. Electricity in one form or another underlies just about everything around you. It's in the lightning from the sky, it's in the spark beneath your feet when you scuff across a rug, and it's what holds atoms together to form molecules. This chapter is about electrostatics or electricity at rest. Electrostatics involves electric charges, the forces between them, and their behavior in materials. An understanding of electricity requires a step-by-step -step approach for one concept is the building block for the next. So please study this material with extra care. It is a good idea at this time to lean more heavily on the laboratory part of your course, for doing physics is better than only studying physics. How can an object become electrically charged? Obtain an electrophorus and rub the insulating plate with a piece of wool, fur, or cloth. Lower the pie pan onto the plate. Touch the pie pan with your finger. The pan should now be charged. Bring the pan in contact with an electroscope or hold it near a thin stream of water or small pieces of paper. Observing, what evidence do you have that the pie pan was actually charged? Predicting, how many times do you think you can charge the pie pan without having to once again rub the insulating plate? Making generalizations, based on your experimentation with electrophorus, how would you define electric charge? 32.1. Electrical forces and charge. You are familiar with the force of gravity. It attracts you to Earth, and you call it your weight. Now consider a force acting on you that is billions upon billions of times stronger. Such a force could compress you to a size of about the thickness of a piece of paper. But suppose that in addition to this enormous force, there is a repelling force that is also billions upon billions of times stronger than gravity. The two forces acting on you would balance each other and have no noticeable effect at all, as shown in figure 32.1. It so happens that there is a pair of such forces acting on you all the time. Electrical forces. The enormous attractive and repulsive electrical forces between the charges in the Earth and the charges in your body balance out, leaving the relatively weaker force of gravity which only attracts. Hence, your weight is due only to gravity. The atom. Electrical forces arise from particles in atoms. In the simple model of the atom proposed in the early 1900s by Ernest Rutherford and Niels Bohr, a positively charged nucleus is surrounded by electrons as illustrated in figure 32.2. The protons in the nucleus attract electrons and hold them in orbit. Electrons are attracted to protons, but electrons repel other electrons. The fundamental electrical property to which the mutual attractions or repulsions between electrons or protons is attributed is called charge. By convention, general agreement, the electrons are negatively charged and protons positively charged. Figure 32.2. The helium nucleus is composed of two protons and two neutrons. The positively charged protons attract two negative 
electrons. Neutrons have no charge and are neither attracted nor repelled by charged particles. Here are some important facts about atoms. 1. Every atom has a positively charged nucleus surrounded by negatively charged electrons. 2. All electrons are identical. That is, each has the same mass and the same quantity of negative charge as every other electron. 3. The nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons. The common form of hydrogen, which has no neutrons, is the only exception. All protons are identical. Similarly, all neutrons are identical. A proton has nearly 2,000 times the mass of an electron, but its positive charge is equal in magnitude to the negative charge of an electron. A neutron has slightly greater mass than a proton and has no charge. 4. Atoms have as many electrons as protons, so a neutral atom has zero net charge, attraction and repulsion. Just why electrons repel electrons and are attracted to protons is beyond the scope of this book. We simply say that this electric behavior is fundamental or basic. The fundamental rule at the base of all electrical phenomena is that like charges repel and opposite charges attract. The old saying that opposites attract, usually referring to people, was first popularized by public lecturers who traveled about by horse and wagon to entertain people by demonstrating the scientific marvels of electricity. An important part of these demonstrations was the charging and discharging of pith balls. Pith is a light, spongy plant tissue. Balls of pith were coated with aluminum paint, so their surfaces would conduct electricity. When suspended from a silk thread, such a ball would be attracted to a rubber rod, just rubbed with cat's fur. But when the two made contact, the force of attraction would change to a force of repulsion. Thereafter, the ball would be repelled by the rubber rod, but attracted to the glass rod that had just been rubbed with silk. Figure 32.3 shows how a pair of pith balls charged in different ways exhibits both attraction and repulsion. The lecturer pointed out that nature provides two kinds of charge, just as it provides two sexes. Notes. Negative and positive are just the names given to opposite charges. The names chosen could just as well have been east and west, or top and down, or Mary and Larry. Concept check. What is the fundamental rule at the base of all electrical phenomena? Figure 32.3. The fundamental rule of all electrical phenomena is that like charges repel and opposite charges attract. 32.2, conservation of charge. Electrons and protons have electric charges. In a neutral atom, there are as many electrons as protons, so there is no net charge. The, positive, the total positive charge balances the total negative charge exactly. If an electron is removed from an atom, the atom is no longer neutral. The atom has one more positive charge, proton, than negative charge, electron, and is said to be positively charged. A charged atom is called an ion. A positive ion has a negative, has a net positive charge. It has lost one or more electrons. A negative ion has a net negative charge. It has gained one or more extra electrons electrically charged objects. Matter is made of atoms, and atoms are made of electrons and protons, and neutrons as well. An object that has equal numbers of electrons and protons has no net electrical 
charge. But if there is an imbalance in the numbers, the object is then electrically charged. An imbalance comes about by adding or removing electrons. Although the innermost electrons in an atom are bound very tightly to the oppositely charged atomic nucleus, the outermost electrons of many atoms are bound very loosely and can be easily dislodged. How much energy is required to tear an electron away from an atom varies for different substances. The electrons are held more firmly in rubber than in fur, for example. Hence, when a rubber rod is rubbed by a piece of fur, as illustrated in figure 32-4, electrons transfer from the fur to the rubber rod. The rubber then has an excess of electrons and is negatively charged. The fur, in turn, has a deficiency of electrons and is positively charged. The, if you rub a glass or plastic rod with silk, you'll find that the rod becomes positively charged. The silk has a greater affinity for electrons than the glass or the plastic rod. The electrons are rubbed off the rod and onto the silk. An object that has unequal numbers of electrons and protons is electrically charged. If it has more electrons and protons, the object is negatively charged. If it has more, if it has fewer electrons and protons, it is positively charged. Figure 32-4, when electrons are transferred from the fur to the rod, the rod becomes negatively charged. Principle of conservation of charge. The principle that electrons are neither created nor destroyed, but are simply transferred from one material to another is known as conservation of charge. In every event, whether large scale or at the atomic or nuclear level, the principle of conservation of charge applies. No case of the creation or destruction of net electric charge has ever been found. The conservation of charge is a cornerstone in physics, ranking with the conservation of energy and momentum. Any object that is electrically charged has an excess or deficiency of some whole number of electrons. Electrons cannot be divided into fractions of electrons. This means that the charge of an object is a whole number multiple of the charge of an electron. It cannot have a charge equal to the charge of 1.5 or 1,000.5 electrons, for example. All charged objects to date have a charge that is a whole number multiple of the charge of a single electron. Concept check. What causes an object to become electrically neutral? Notes. Conservation of charge is another of the physics conservation principles. Recall from previous chapters conservation momentum and conservation of energy. If you scuff electrons onto your shoes while walking across a rug, are you negatively or positively charged? When your rubber or plastic soled shoes drag across a rug, they pick up electrons from the rug in the same way you charge a rubber or plastic rod by rubbing it with a cloth. You have more electrons after you scuff your shoes, so you are negatively charged, and the rug is positively charged. The threat of static charge, science, technology, and society. Today, electronics technicians in high technology firms that build, test, and repair electronic circuit components follow procedures to guard against static charge to prevent damage to delicate circuits. Some circuit components are so sensitive that they can be fried by static electric sparks. So electronic technicians work in environments free of high resistance surfaces where static charge can accumulate and where clothing of special fabric with ground wires between 
their sleeves and their socks. Some wear special wristbands that are clipped to the grounded surface so that any charge that builds up by movement on the chair, for example, is discharged. As electronic components become smaller and circuit elements are placed closer together, the threat of electric sparks produced short circuit becomes greater and greater. Critical thinking. What effects on your daily life are the caused by static charge? What can you do to minimize these effects? This is a lightning rod in the picture, an example. It's a good example. 32.3, Coulomb's Law. Recall from Newton's law of gravitation that the gravitational force between two objects of mass 1 and mass 2 is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, where g is the universal gravitational constant. And that's the equation f equals g times m1, m2 divided by d squared. Force, charges, and distance. The electric force between any two objects obeys a similar inverse square relationship with distance. Now, don't forget that is Newton's universal law of gravitation. It's going to become very important relative to Coulomb's law. Make sure you understand it perfectly. The relationship among electric force charges and distance, now known as Coulomb's law, was discovered by the French physicist Charles Coulomb, 1736 to 1806 in the 18th century. Coulomb's law states that for charged particles or objects that are small compared with the distance between them, the force between the charge varies directly as the product of the charges and inversely as the square of the distance between them. Sound familiar? So instead of mass 1 and 2, you'll have charge 1 and 2. And instead of, instead of g, what will you have? You'll have something instead of g. So the force between two charges is going to be similar to the gravitational forces. Coulomb's law can be expressed as F equals K times Q1, Q2 over D squared, where D is the distance between the charged particles. Q1 represents the quantity of charge of one particle, and Q2 the quantity of charge of another particle. And K is the proportionality constant. The S1 unit of charge is the Coulomb, abbreviated C. Common sense might say that it is the charge of a single electron, but it isn't. For historical reasons, it turns out that a charge of one Coulomb is a charge of 6.24 billion billion, 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electrons. This might seem like a great number of electrons, but it represents only the amount of charge that passes through a common 100-watt 100, 100 light bulb in about one second. The electrical proportionality constant. The proportionality constant, K, in Coulomb's law is similar to G in Newton's law of gravitation. Instead of being a very small number like G, the, electrically, the electrical proportionality constant K is a very large number. Rounded off, it equals K equals 9 billion Newton meters squared over C squared. Or, in scientific notation, K equals 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared over Coulomb squared. The units Newton meter squared over Coulomb squared convert the right side of the equation to the unit of force, the Newton n when the charges are in Coulomb c and the distance is in meters m. Note that if a pair of charges of one Coulomb each were about one meter apart, the force of repulsion between the two charges would be nine billion Newtons much greater force than in gravity. 
how does the electric force between the proton and the electron in a hydrogen atom compare to the gravitational force between these two particles? The hydrogen atom's nucleus is a proton, mass of 1.7 times 10 to the negative 27th kilogram, outside of which there is a single electron with a mass of 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms at an average separation distance d of 5.3 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. To solve for the electric force, use Coulomb law, Coulomb's law where both the electron QE and the proton QP have the same magnitude, or 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 Coulombs. So you're going to plug in the values. There's K, QE, QP, and D, and you'll get 8.2 times 10 to the negative 8. Make sure that you can calculate this value on your calculator and that you are having no problems. Here is the equation for the force of gravity. Check your data, plug it in, make sure you can calculate it yourself. That comes out to 3.7 times 10 to the negative 47 newtons. That's the force of gravity. A comparison of the two forces is best shown by their ratio. The electrical force between the properties is more than 10 to the 39th times greater than the gravitational force. In other words, the electric forces that subatomic particle, particles exert on one another are so much stronger than their mutual gravitational forces that gravitation can be completely ignored. That would be more than 10 times the weight of a battleship. Obviously, such amounts of net charge do not exist in our everyday environment. As can be seen in figure 32.5, Newton's law of gravitation for masses is similar to Coulomb's law for electric charges. Whereas the gravitational force of attraction between a pair of one kilogram masses is extremely small, the electrical force between a pair of one Coulomb charges is extremely large. The greatest difference between gravitation and electrical forces is that while gravity only attracts, electrical forces may either attract or repel. Think, what is the chief significance of the fact that G in Newton's law of gravitation is a small number and K in Coulomb's law is a large number when both are expressed in SI units. The small value of G indicates that gravity is a weak force. The large value of K indicates that the electrical force is enormous in comparison. Figure 32.5, Newton's law of gravitation is similar to Coulomb's law. The electrical forces in atoms. Because most objects have almost exactly equal number of electrons and protons, electrical forces usually balance out. Between Earth and the Moon, for example, there is no measurable electrical force. In general, the weak gravitational force, which only attracts, is the predominant force between astronomical bodies. Although electrical forces balance out for astronomical and everyday objects, at the atomic level, this is not always true. Often, two or more atoms, when close together, share electrons. The negative electrons of one atom may at times be closer to the neighboring atom's positive nucleus than they are to the average location of the neighbor's electrons. Then the attractive force between these charges is greater than the repulsive force. This is called bonding and leads to the formation of molecules. It would be wise for anyone planning to study chemistry or biology to know something about electricity. Concept check. What does Coulomb's law state? Notes. Coulomb's law is like Newton's law of gravity, but unlike gravity, electric forces can be attractive or repulsive.
think, A, if an electron at a certain distance from a charged particle is attracted with a certain force, how will the force compare at twice this distance? And B, is the charged particle in this case positive or negative? A, in accord with the inverse square law, at twice the distance, the force will be one-fourth as much. Since there is a force of attraction, the charges must be opposite in sign, so the charged particle is positive. 32.4 Conductors and Insulators the Electrons are more easily moved in some materials than in others. Outer electrons of the atoms in a metal are not anchored to the nuclei of particular atoms, but are free to roam in the material. Materials through which electric current can flow are called conductors. Metals are good conductors for the motion of electric charges for the same reason they are good conductors of heat. Their electrons are loose. Electrons in other materials, rubber and glass for example, are tightly bound and remain with particular atoms. They are not free to wander about in other atoms in the material. These materials known as insulators are poor conductors of electricity for the same reason they are generally poor conductors of heat. Whether a substance is classified as a conductor or an insulator depends on how tightly the atoms of the substance hold their electrons. Electrons move easily in good conductors and poorly in good insulators. All substances can be arranged in order of their ability to conduct electrical charges. Those at the top of the list are the conductors and those at the bottom of the list are insulators. The ends of the list are very far apart. The conductivity of metal, for example, can be more than a million trillion times greater than the conductivity of an insulator, such as glass. In power lines, such as those shown in figure 32.6, charge flows much more easily through hundreds of kilometers of metal wire than through the few centimeters of insulating material that separates the wire from the supporting tower. In a common appliance cord, charges will flow through several meters of wire to the appliance and then through its electrical network and then back through the return wire rather than flow directly across from one wire to another through the tiny thickness of rubber insulation. Some materials such as germanium and silicon are good insulators in their pure crystalline form but increase tremendously in conductivity when even one atom in 10 million are replaced with an impurity that adds or removes an electron from the crystalline structure. Figure 32.6 It is easier for electric charge to flow through hundreds of kilometers of metal wire than through a few centimeters of insulating material. Semiconductors are materials that can be made to behave sometimes as an insulator and sometimes as conductors. Atoms in a semiconductor hold their atoms until given small energy boosts. This occurs in photovoltaic cells that convert solar energy into electrical energy. Notes. Materials that don't hold electrons tightly lose them to materials that hold electrons more tightly. Thin layers of semiconducting material sandwiched together make up transistors, which are used in digital media players, computers, and a variety of electrical applications. Transistors amplify electric signals and act as electric switches to control current in circuits with very little power. Concept check. What is the difference between a good conductor and a good insulator? 32.5. Charging by friction and contact. Two ways 
electric charge can be transferred are by friction and by contact. We are all familiar with the electrical effects produced by friction. We can stroke a cat's fur and hear the crackling of sparks that are produced or comb our hair in front of a mirror in a dark room and see as well as hear the sparks of electricity. We can scratch our shoes across a rug and feel the tingle as we reach for the doorknob and do the same when sliding across seats while parked in an automobile as illustrated in figure 32.7. In all these cases, the electrons are being transferred by friction when one material rubs against another. Figure 32.7, if you slide across a seat in an automobile, you are in danger of being charged by friction. Electrons can also be transferred from one material to another by simply touching. When a charged rod is placed in contact with a neutral object, some charge will transfer to the neutral object. This method of charging is simply called charging by contact. If the object is a good conductor, the charge will spread to all parts of its surface because the like charges repel each other. If it is a good conductor, the extra charge will stay close to where the object was touched. Concept check. What are two ways electric charge can be transferred? 32.6. Charging by induction. If a charged object is brought near a conducting surface, even without physical contact, electrons will move in the conducting surface. In figure 32.8a, the uncharged insulated metal spheres touch each other, so in effect, they form a single non-charged conductor. In figure 32.8b, a negatively charged rod is held near sphere A. Electrons in the metal are repelled by the rod, and excess negative charge has moved onto sphere B, leaving sphere A with excess positive charge. The charge on the two spheres has been redistributed or induced. Figure 32.8, charging by induction can be illustrated using two insulated metal spheres. In figure 32.9d, the sphere is left positively charged. In figure 32.8c, the spheres are separated while the rod is still present. In 32.8d, the rod has been removed, and the spheres are charged equally and oppositely. They have been charged by induction, which is the charging of an object without direct contact. Since the charged rod never touched them, it retains its initial charge. A single sphere can be charged similarly by induction. Consider a metal sphere that hangs from a non-conducting string. In figure 32.9a, the net charge on the metal sphere is zero. In 32.9b, a charge redistributed is induced by the presence of a charged rod. The net charge on the sphere is still zero. In 32.9c, touching the sphere removes electrons from contact. Figure 32.9, charge induction by grounding can be illustrated using a metal sphere hanging from a non-conducting string. In figure 32.9, the sphere is attracted to the negative rod. It swings over to it and touches it. Now electrons move into the sphere from the rod. The sphere has been negatively charged by contact. In 32.9F, the negative sphere is repelled by the negative rod. When we touch the metal sphere with a finger, as illustrated in 32.9C, charges that repel each other have a conducting path to a practically infinite reservoir 
for electric charge, the ground. When we allow charges to move off or onto a conductor by touching it, it is common to say that we are grounding it. Chapter 34 returns to this idea of grounding in the discussion of electric currents. Charging by induction occurs during thunderstorms. Figure 32.9, charge induction by grounding can be illustrated by using a metal sphere hanging from a non-conducting string. The negatively charged bottoms of clouds induce a positive charge on the surface of the earth below, as seen in figure 32.10. Benjamin Franklin was the first to demonstrate this in his famous kite flying experiment in which he proved that lightning is an electrical phenomenon. Most lightning is an electric, electrical discharge between oppositely charged parts of clouds. The kind of lightning we are most familiar with is the electric discharge between the clouds and the oppositely charged ground below. Franklin also found that charge flows readily to and from sharp points and fashion the first lightning rod. If the rod is placed above a building connected to the ground, the point of the rod collects electrons from the air, preventing a large buildup of positive charge on the building by induction. 3210, the bottom of the negatively charged cloud induces a positive charge at the surface of the ground below. This continual leaking of charge prevents a charge buildup that might otherwise lead to a sudden discharge between the cloud and the building. The primary purpose of the lightning rod then is to prevent a lightning discharge from occurring. If for any reason sufficient charge does not leak from the air to the rod and lightning strikes anyway, it may be attracted to the rod and short-circuited to the ground, sparing the building. Concept check. What happens when a charged object is placed near a conducting surface? Why does the negative rod in 32.8 have the same charge before and after spheres are charged, but not when charging takes place, as in 32.9. In the charging process in 32.8, no contact was made between the negative rod and either of the spheres. In the charging process in figure 32.9, however, the rod touched the sphere when it was positively charged. A transfer of charge by contact reduced the negatively negative charge on the rod. Is the water that comes out of your faucet charged? 1. Charge a comb by running it through your hair. This will work especially well if the weather is dry. 2. Now bring the comb near some tiny bits of paper. Explain your observations. 3. Next, Place the charged comb near a thin stream of water from the faucet. 4. Is there an electrical interaction between the comb and the stream? 5. Think. Does this mean the stream of water is charged? Why or why not? 32.7. Charge Polarization. Charging by induction is not restricted to conductors. Charge polarization can occur in insulators that are near a charged object. When a charged rod is brought near an insulator, there are no free electrons to migrate through the insulating material. Instead, as shown in figure 3211A, there is a rearrangement of the position of charges within the atoms and molecules themselves. One side of the atom or molecule is induced to be slightly more positive or negative than the opposite side, and the atom or molecule is said to be electrically polarized. 
figure 3211A, when an external negative charge is brought closer from the left, the charges within a neutral atom or molecule rearrange. B, all the atoms or molecules near the surface of the insulator become electrically polarized. If the charged rod is negative, say, then the positive side of the atom or molecule is towards the rod, and negative side of the atom or molecule is away from it. The atoms or molecules near the surface all become aligned this way, as seen in figure 3211b. Examples of charged polarization. This explains why electrically neutral bits of paper are attracted to a charged object, such as the combo shown in figure 3212. Molecules are polarized in the paper, with the oppositely charged sides of molecules closest to the charged object. Closeness wins, and the bits of paper experience a net attraction. Sometimes they will cling to the charged object and suddenly fly off. Figure 3212. A charged comb attracts an uncharged piece of paper because the force of attraction for the closer charge is greater than the force of repulsion for the farther charge. This indicates that charging by contact has occurred. The paper bits have acquired the same sign of charge as the charged object and are then repelled. Rub an inflated balloon on your hair and it becomes charged. Place the balloon against the wall and it sticks. As shown in figure 3213, the charge on the balloon induces an opposite charge on the wall. Closeness wins for the charge on the balloon is slightly closer to the opposite induced charge than to the charge of the same side. Electric dipoles. Many molecules, H2O for example, are electrically polarized in their normal states. The distribution of electric charge is not perfectly even. Figure 3213, the negatively charged balloon polarizes molecules in the wooden wall and creates a positively charged surface so the balloon sticks to the wall. As illustrated in figure 3214, there is little more negative charge on one side of the molecule than on the other. Such molecules are said to be electric dipoles. Notes, if you rub a balloon on your hair, you will find that the balloon will stick to the wall. Notes, be glad that water is an electric dipole. If its opposite ends didn't attract different ions, almost all the chemistry that occurs in aqueous solutions would be impossible. Three cheers for the electric dipole nature of the water molecule. Figure 3214, an H2O molecule is an electric dipole. In summary, objects are electrically charged in three ways. One, by friction, when electrons are transferred by friction from one object to another. Two, by contact, when electrons are transferred by one object to another by direct contact without rubbing. A charged rod placed in contact with an uncharged piece of metal, for example, will transfer charge to the metal. Three, by induction, when electrons are caused to gather or disperse by the presence of nearby charge, even without physical contact. A charged rod held near a metal surface, for example, repels charges of the same sign as those on the rod and attracts opposite charges. The result is a redistrib redistribution of charge on the object without any change in its net charge. If the metal surface is discharged by contact with a finger, for example, then a net charge will be left. If the object is an insulator, on the other hand, then a realignment of charge rather than migration of charge occurs.
This is charge polarization in which the surface near the charged object becomes oppositely charged. This occurs when you stick a charged balloon to a wall. Concept check. What happens when an insulator is in the presence of a charged object? Microwave cooking, physics in the kitchen. Imagine an enclosure filled with table tennis balls among a few batons, all at rest. Now imagine the baton suddenly flipping back and forth like semi-rotating propellers striking neighboring table tennis balls. Almost immediately, most table tennis balls are energized, vibrating in all directions. A microwave oven works similarly. The batons are water molecules that flip back and forth in rhythm with microwaves in the enclosure. The table tennis balls are non-water molecules that make up the bulk of the material being cooked. H2O molecules are polar with opposite charges on opposite sides. When an electric field is imposed on them, they align with the field like a compass aligns with a magnetic field. Microwaves are an electric field that oscillates. So H2O molecules oscillate also and quite energetically. Food is cooked by a sort of kinetic friction as flip-flopping H2O molecules increase the thermal motion of surrounding food molecules. A microwave oven wouldn't work without the presence of the electric dipoles in the food, usually, but not always, water. That's why microwaves pass through foam, paper, or ceramic plates with no effect. Microwaves also reflect and bounce off conductors with no effect. They do, however, energize water molecules. Summary, electrostatics. Like charges repel and opposite charges attract. An object has, that has unequal numbers of electrons and protons is electrically charged. Coulomb's law states that for charged particles or objects that are small compared with the distance between them, the force between the charges varies directly as the product of the charges and inversely as the square of the distance between them. Electrons move easily in good conductors and poorly in good insulators. Electric charges can be transferred by friction and by contact. If a charged object is brought near a conducting surface, electrons will, will move in the conducting surface. Charge polarization can occur in insulators that are near a charged object.